I would say that 10 years ago, the organization could best be described as German. It was very, very early days. In the ensuing 10 years, I've seen amazing growth in the organization. Uh, its reach, its professionalism, and in particular in Dylan, who's leadership of Caminos and mastery of this diverse and complex area of water and in particular the way that Caminos has integrated community outreach with technological technological sophistication it is truly remarkable it's really worthy of all of our respect I could say a lot more in praise for the man behind Caminos but I think we'll let his words speak for itself so Please join me in welcome to the I3 stage, Dylan Terrell. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, everybody, for being here today. Um, so, um, so some of you, I'm sure, have heard me. I know, I know some of you have heard me speak before. And, and today, it's an interesting opportunity for me because I get to, to not talk so much about Caminos de Agua, but talk. And, and, and talk a little bit about the water issues here, but actually talk more about the global water issues, uh, Mexican water issues, and how that all ties together. So um, it's pretty exciting. It's also a very, very big topic. Uh, my, my first rough draft was about two and a half hours, and I, I, won't, I, won't, I won't subjugate you guys to that today. I managed to get it down. Um, but my goal here is to take you around the, take you around the world a little bit. i got to use this microphone. Um, and, and talk about uh, water issues and how, how how these water issues are connected to, to deeper issues and how they're connected to each other around the world. Sorry, I'm gonna put on my timer. So just starting off here, um, behind all these challenges, right? All these challenges, climate change, poverty reduction, um, food security, all these issues, there's always water. We never talk about water. So let's talk about water today. What we have here is a global map uh, developed by Water Resources Institute that's mapping water stress around the world. Now this can be a really important uh, 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 through line for our talk today. And what we see here is all these red points all throughout here are, are showing regions that are highly or extremely uh, highly water stressed. That means that their water resources, um, in this case their freshwater resources, which is a mixture of groundwater and surface water, are, they're using upwards of 80% or more of those water resources every year, which means that they can't adapt very well to things like climate change um, or, or, or drought. And right now, about a quarter of the entire world, a quarter of the global population, lives in extreme water stress conditions. About half of the world, or 3.6 billion people, live in some sort of water stress conditions. That means they, they, leave, they, they live at least one month out of the year uh, with, with water security issues. Now that's going to jump. By 2050, we're, we're anticipating about 5.5 billion people around the globe are going to be suffering from these issues. Now what's that going to lead to? It's going to lead to, and it already is leading to, what we call uh, things like day zero. Day zero is this really ominous term when a community's water supply basically runs out. Now, that's not something that's going to happen just in 2050. It's something happening right now, and that's kind of where that's where I wanted to start this talk today um, with a more extreme example of, of what this really looks like around the world. So I'm going, to, I'm going to start off by taking us to Chennai, India. Chennai, India is on the Bay of Bengal. It's the sixth largest city in India, and in 2019, their main water resources started to go dry. This is one of the main water resources, the Lake Bosal in, in Chennai, uh, in 2018, and then one year later in 2019, uh, that basically went from uh, left an entire population with, with, with very little water access. So what's going on here? Well, on June 19th um, of 2019, they declared day zero, the day that the water officially runs out um, in Chennai. This is a, this is a, a large city of 4.6 million people. And they depend on four major reservoirs that are filled uh, during a very, very short monsoon season uh, every year. Now, with climate change and with increasing droughts, it's becoming harder and harder to fill those, uh, fill, fill those reservoirs up. So over the years, Chennai has started to focus much more on groundwater. People started drilling boreholes in their backyards and sucking up groundwater until that started to go dry. And that's what led to this point um, uh, in, in 2019. Um, and what happened is, <laughs> this kind of chaos right here, right, of uh, 
bringing in about 15,000 tankers every single day to meet the water demand for, for, these, fam for, for these millions and millions of people, right? Um, 9,000 of those were, were state-sponsored, and another 6,000 or so were privately bought. Um, and I bring this up now at the beginning because this is the result of everything we're going to be talking about, of climate change, of all these, these issues coming down, tied in with bad management or planning, um, and all of, all of these different issues, right? And so uh, I just kind of wanted to start off with the worst, and then hopefully it's going to be a little bit better. Uh, uh, but, but start us off there, and, uh, and we're going to see how all this plays together. So, but before going on, um, I want to introduce a theme that's really, really important to the talk today, which is the world is thirsty because it's hungry. <clears throat> what does that mean? Well, all of these issues, once again, are tied together. And uh, the, the Food and Agriculture Organization for the UN put together what they call the, glo the Global Framework for Action, which means that we can't look at these things siloed. We tend to look at things like water and, and climate change in, in silos, but they're really well connected. If we're going to meet the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, we need to look at at least these areas much more holistically and much more inter in, in, interconnectedly. Um, you know, if we're going to achieve food security and reduce poverty, well, we need water to grow the crops, but water is going to be more and more scarce thanks to climate change, right? So it's this kind of vicious circle. So we need to be attacking all of these things together. So let's start looking at some of this, right? Agriculture. Agriculture is responsible for 70% of all of the fresh water we use in this world. This is the combination of groundwater that comes from our feet and uh, the lakes and rivers we, we use uh, to, to, to harvest water. Now, 42% of all agricultural water use uh, goes to livestock. Now, cattle are not that thirsty. Only about 1% 1, 1 actually goes to their drinking water. The other 41% is tied up in the food they eat. The livestock, uh, alfalfa, that's what we see here. This is a massive alfalfa production right here in the desert of Arizona. Um, but it's not just the water. On top of that, uh, agriculture is using about a third of all the cropland is used to produce just feed crops for the, the grazing cattle and, uh, and, and the livestock. And a quarter of all ice-free land in the world is occupied by pastures currently. Now, agriculture is also responsible for contaminating our water supplies, uh, something I'm not going to go into too deep today, but in a very myriad different ways, from nitrates coming off of, of large feed uh, farms um, to uh, organic chemicals come, getting into surface water supplies from pesticides um, and things like that. And we need to produce more. You know, we need to produce an estimate between 70 and 110 percent more food by 2050 if we're going to meet the need. So some of you guys may have seen something like this before, right? How much water does it actually take to produce a pound of beef? This is this is uh, this is through the water community, you know, very very prevalent. About 1,800 gallons uh, for one pound of beef. A much more ominous translation to that. To, to at least to me, is 15,000 liters for one kilo, right? Now, we use this as kind of a shock statement, and it's, it's true, it is true, but it's, it's kind of, it's misleading. Um, and this kind of, this also gets to the heart of some of the issues I'm gonna be talking about today, is because this is a mixture, these 1,800 gallons for, for one pound of beef, this is a mixture of what we call blue water, which is fresh water, which is, again, groundwater, rivers, and, and things like that, and also what we call green water, which is rainwater. And actually, that makes up, globally speaking, the mo most of the water used to produce our livestock. However, again, this is the re a real number. And so what I'm trying to get at here is that this, these are really locally concentrated issues, right? So globally speaking, livestock is not the, the water hog that everybody kind of makes it out to be. But locally speaking, it is. In very specific areas, we're going to see where we're using blue water, fresh water exclusively to produce uh, livestock, but that can have a really, really big impact on water supplies. One other thing I want to sh show here is that it's not just about water, right? Uh, livestock is really connected to uh, our carbon footprint. What we have here is the average carbon footprint of a Mexican today. It's about six and a half uh, tons of, of, of carbon per year. And the number one cause here in Mexico uh, of, uh, that we can control uh, of our carbon offset, of our carbon footprint is right here, is this one right here, which is meat and fish. So it's a huge, huge uh, contributor as well to, to uh, the, the carbon issues. Sorry, I need water just for a second. Okay, so I want to start taking us on our journey, and I was 
thinking a lot about where to take you guys, you know, all to different parts of the world and, think, and things like that. Um, but it really made a lot more sense to start in our own backyard um, in the U.S. because there's so much going on in the U.S. that is similar to what's happening here in Greater Mexico and, and specifically here in our region. There's so much tied, uh, tied, tied to these issues. And so uh, I wanted to start with the Colorado River Basin. Now, if anybody's heard any news of the Colorado River Basin in the past couple of years, you might have remembered some images like this, right? We're not really sure what's going on, but we can see that this is a body of water, and it looks like it's dropped really precipitously in a very probably short amount of time, right? But what is this? This is Lake Mead at the Hoover Dam. Uh, the Colorado River feeds Lake Mead, and in 2022, it reached the lowest level in its history, except for when they were filling it up, of about 1,040 feet. Now, if it were to have dropped to 950 feet, the Hoover Dam would have stopped generating electricity for a few million people. Um, and if it would have dropped down to 895 feet, it would have hit what we call dead pool, which means water wouldn't flow through the Hoover Dam anymore. Sorry. And uh, millions of people would be left without water. So let's take a closer look at the Colorado River Basin. I don't know if you can really see this. There's a very faint outline here. But, but the basin is separated into two sections, the upper basin and the lower basin. The upper basin states are here, Wyoming, Colorado, Utah, and, and New Mexico, and they get most of their water from direct river flow. And then we've got lower basin states like Arizona, Nevada, and, Cal and California, which get most of their water from, from reservoirs in, in the system and massive um, um, engineering feats uh, like aqua, um, aqueducts and, and things like that to move the water around. This system serves 40 million people their water, about 5.5 million acres of farmland, um, and it also generates electricity for millions of homes and millions of businesses through, through the reservoirs at Lake Mead and, and Lake Powell. So what's going on with the water here? We use about 1.9 trillion gallons of water. It's just one of those numbers that nobody can really fathom what it really means, but it's a lot of water. It supplies 40 million people with, with, with all the water. And we can see here that you know, we're using it for residential, commercial, uh, a lot of crops, and we can, you guys can probably already guess where the majority of this uh, water goes to. 79% of it goes to agriculture in the entire system. Uh, and if we look really closely, I mean, we're producing things like cotton, wheat, corn grain, and barley, but really, 56% of all of the water goes to livestock feed. 1% in actually watering, and the other 55% in, uh, in, in actually producing the feed, right? Um, uh, alfalfa, hay, grasses, and actually 37% of all the water that flows through the Colorado River Basin um, is for alfalfa. Alfalfa is almost exclusively used for dairy cattle. This is three times the amount of residential water use that, that, that's used in the system. Now, despite that, uh, the biggest risk to the system right now, or, or, the, or the biggest new user of water is in fact residential, and uh, that's where I want to move us to next, is specifically Phoenix, Arizona, which is part of this system. Now, before we go too deep into Phoenix, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the water supply. So they do re receive a good amount, about 36% of their water from the Colorado River, but the majority of their water actually comes from groundwater. Now, groundwater in the US, there's been a recent uh, data set created by the New York Times, of all, of all people, um, that's the most comprehensive that I've, I think I've ever seen. It's 80,000 different wells throughout the United States that they've, they've, they've collected millions of samples over 40 years to see what's going on with groundwater in the U.S. because we honestly didn't have an idea because it was so fragmented. There, there's no communication, there's no national system, um, and there's no really national system anywhere to, to monitor this kind of stuff. And what they found was pretty horrific. Uh, with these 80,000 systems, about 45%, almost half of all the wells have been in significant decline over the past 40 years. Uh, and these, these wells are serving for farming, but also they're tied to like 90% of all the drinking water systems in the U.S. So this is a big, big deal. And what's happening with climate change is that there's, there's less snowpack, which means there's less water getting into rivers, which means we're drilling and we're taking out more and more water. And that's exactly what's been happening in Arizona and Phoenix. What we can see here is that over the last 10 years, the median well depth, these are all the, all the wells that have been cropping up around Arizona, the median well depth went from 96 feet 10 years ago to 196 feet this past year. An absolute brutal overexploitation of that finite water resource. <clears throat> so, what's going on with Phoenix? Phoenix is the fastest growing region in the country right now. And this year, 
Arizona said that Phoenix doesn't have enough groundwater to serve the developments that are already approved. So they canceled those right away, right? Of course not, they're moving forward. Um, so what are they gonna do? Where are they gonna get water from, right? Um, well, quite clearly, the, the, the only option on the table right now, the only one that's been submitted, and the only one that's actually under consideration, which will probably get approved in some form, is this. Running a pipeline from Mexico 200 miles across the UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, a 2,000 uh, feet uh, uh, incline um, to, to Phoenix here. Now, now it's not just pumping the water because they're pumping it from the Gulf of California, also known as the, the Sea of Cortez. This is, this is salt water. You can't, just, you can't just drink salt water, so you have to desalinate it, right? And so they're gonna build this, this big desal desalination plant in, in Puerto Penasco, Mexico, um, and pump that water up. Now, this is going to be about 10 times more costly than, than, than water from the Colorado River system, um, understandably so. But the big issue here is, is, well, what I think the big issue is, is, is the brine. What is the brine? Well, when you treat uh, water, when you desalinate water, you create another, uh, you know, for every liter you treat, you create about a liter and a half of brine, which is this brackish wastewater, which is really heavy, heavily contaminated with, with salts, but also with uh, chemicals that are used in the desalination process. And normally it's not a huge deal uh, in, in desalination because it, it's usually just put back into the ocean and it, it disperses and it, it's, not a, it's not a huge deal. But here, they're gonna put it right back into the Sea of Cortez. This is more enclosed, right? And this also happens to be where 50% of Mexican uh, fishing industry exists. It's all going right back into the Sea of Cortez. And there's major, major concerns about killing off plankton and all sorts of other issues that are gonna, uh, at the base of the food chain, that are gonna impact Mexicans, uh, Mexico's fishing industry. Um, as, as one person said, uh, the, the water's going to the U.S., but the environmental impacts stay in Mexico, which is unfortunately all too often the case here. Um, so with that, uh, I wanna stay on this for a minute because desalination is actually really, really important when we're talking about water security moving forward. We have a lot of people living in semi-arid and deserts around the world, and uh, we need to figure out how to get them water, and, and desalination is, is, is a technology we have to lean into. And so uh, from there, I wanna to go to Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. I also wanna go there because that's where the COP28 is happening right now. Uh, the big climate con conference um, is happening in Dubai, which uh, some contention, I would say, or a lot of contention. Um, but Dubai, and, and in general, in the, in the Middle East, they've been depending on desalination technology for, for many, many years. Um, here's here's uh, desal in, in Dubai. Uh, this is the, the deep the deep dive Dubai, which is the world's largest freshwater pool, 3.7 bil billion gallons, or sorry, million gallons um, of water, for, so people can go um, scuba diving in, in, in the desert. Now, Dubai produces about 620 billion liters of, of desalinated water a year for about 4.7 million people in total. There's 3.6 million residents and another million plus um, uh, of tourists. That's their, their, main, their main thing there. There's 47, uh, 43 de desalination plants, and right now they're all fueled by fossil fuels. This is a really, really energy intensive process. And with that, the United Arab Emirates emitted about 200 million tons of CO2 in 2022, making them one of the largest per capita, um, per capita sorry, uh, emitters globally um, that year. Now, in, in fairness to them, they are pushing to get everything on, um, on, on renewables by 2050 or so. Uh, but again, we have this issue of what do, what do we do with the brine? I keep bringing that up just because it's gonna be really important to figure out. I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> um, there's people much smarter than me that are working on it. But right now, they have the same issue that we're talking about in Arizona, is that that's not going out into the Indian Ocean. That's going into the Persian Gulf, another really closed area where there's been lots of desal brine going into for many, many years. And a lot of people actually relate that to these major algal blooms that have been coming up, killing off of plankton um, at the base, again, of the, of the food chain, and also uh, related to uh, killing off all the coral reef. Um, it's, it's basically all dead in that region right now. Um, so, I want to stay in the Middle East here for a second and talk a little bit more about livestock. Because the Middle East has been uh, upping its consumption of, uh, of livestock and dairy for many, many years, but they don't have any water. And we know that livestock uses a lot of water. So what are they doing? What are they doing? Well, they're importing live, live animals from around the world. From Brazil, from Australia, from Germany, from India. They're coming in, and, and that's how they're, they're meeting their demand. 
Um, they, they raise them in Brazil, and then they ship them over for the last six months of their, their, their life. And then, <laughs> it's actually doing, this is uh, Egypt right here, actually. And what they've done in Egypt is that they, they call this domestic uh, animal production, that they're supporting Egyptian farmers because uh, they can sell this as, as Egyptian beef. Even though it spent most of its life somewhere else, it comes in there and then they say that they're helping Egyptian farmers. Um, but this gets to uh, a big issue that's going to tie to some of these other things that we've been talking about here today. Um, so this is the case of Fondamonte. In 2018, Saudi Arabia banned the, the, um, the growing of green fodder crops like alfalfa because they're so water intensive. Water intensive. It doesn't make sense to desalinate water to produce alfalfa for, um, for livestock. But they're still upping their, their meat consumption and their dairy consumption. So what are they doing? Well, the, the logical answer was to move to Arizona in the desert and produce a bunch of alfalfa there, a bunch of water intensive alfalfa there. Um, this is a this is a real fundament, uh, um, fundamente I don't know how to say it exactly farm in 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 the desert of Arizona, uh, producing alfalfa. They have uh, access. They own or lease about fourteen thousand acres across uh, Arizona and Southern California. Now we know where they get their water, right? Uh, Southern California. That's that's all Colorado River water, and in Arizona, it's all groundwater. The thing with Arizona is that once you have the rights to take up the groundwater, there's no monitoring. There's no metering. You, can, you have unlimited access to water at almost no cost. Fondamonte pays about $76,000 a year for its rights in Arizona. That's it. And what do they do? Well, they grow this alfalfa and they ship it off to dairy cows in the Middle East. So Egypt can have its Egyptian beef. Um, now, the, the governor in Arizona just recently decided to terminate uh, one of these leases because the Colorado River system has been having so many issues with water, people not getting water and things like that. They thought that this was uh, not, not, the, not the best public um, relations image out there. Um, and so they, they terminated one of the leases and they're going to let the other ones expire. But I just bring this up because this, and I'm not, I'm not trying to throw the Middle East under the bus here, uh, but, but, but this, is, this is just some of the absurd absurdities that, that we are dealing with with our food system and our water system uh, around the world. So that brings us to Mexico. Hydro work. Talk about that in just a second here. Um, so, when talking about Mexico, I want to talk specifically today, just for time's sake, about groundwater. Because groundwater is uh, aquifers, they're, they're the most important water supply we have here in Mexico. It represents about 40% of all the water we use, but, but here in our region, up in the north, it's, it's almost 100%. Um, and 24% of all the aquifers that we're seeing here um, are overexploited. That means that we are taking out more water than goes back in through natural processes every year. That means the water table is dropping. That means we're running out of water. Um, now, on top of that, uh, we're not very efficient. About 40 to 47 percent, depending on who you talk to, of all the water pumped up out of these aquifers is lost in the system to leaks because we're not investing in infrastructure. We're not invest investing in maintenance and repairs. Oh, by the way, agriculture is not required to pay for water use in Mexico. I'll sink in for a minute. I'll, I'll come back to it in a second here. Um, so on top of it, so across Mexico, we've got about 427,000 groundwater concessions. There is one entity that can, that can oversee those. That's the Federal Water Commission. That's CONAGUA. They're the ones that can find people for going over their concessions and, and things like that. Do you know how, let me have a guess, how many CONAGUA inspectors there are to see, oversee close to a half a million concessions? Five. Five, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 141. If anybody does any rough math, there's just no way that those people can even see all of those concessions in a year or even a lifetime. Um, but but this, is, this is one of the big challenges we face, right? Uh, so, and that gets us to, to, to this idea, I can coin this term, the, the, the hydroarchy, that's a translation from, from, from Spanish. Um, but, but agriculture uses 75% of all, of all the water here in Mexico. And the majority of it is concession to what to these things called irrigation districts. Now, I can go too deep into it right now. And to be totally frank, I don't fully really understand it because it's a really hard thing to understand. Um, but just to say that about 70% of all the concession water is in the hands of about 2% of the title owners. That means a very small amount of people hold an enormous amount of power over the water we use here in the country. So much so that, that these, these, these irrigation districts 
poured water at times, and they sell it back to municipalities and government. Um, Tijuana has said for years that it's being held hostage by, by Irrigation District Number 14, who hoards the water and, and gives it back to them you know, at really high prices. Um, it's almost impossible to monitor the amount of water pumped by concessions. Uh, because again, there's almost half a million concessions and there's you know, 100 people or 140 people running around trying to, to figure out what's going on with them because there's no digital system that's, that's got all this tied together. Did I, did I mention already that agriculture doesn't have, is not required to pay for water here in Mexico? Okay, so on top of it, federal investment in, in, in water has gone down for a lot of different reasons. But basically, uh, with low gas prices back in, back in about 2015 to 2017, the federal government decided that they were, they were going to drop their investment in, in subsidizing water projects around the country by about 45%. Um, and, that, and with that, they really leaned into this idea that they have um, that this should be run by the municipalities. It is, that's, that's, that's what we live in today, today, is that the municipalities really run the water system throughout the country. So what we're saying there is that we're going to take this vital resource, absolutely necessary for all aspects of human life, and we're going to put it in the hands of the, the least professional, the, the poorest level of government, uh, you know, the, the directors at the municipal water authorities, the average uh, amount of time they're there is less than two years. That's what we decided to do. So I haven't talked a lot about drinking water, but I, I wanted to touch on this in a minute because to see what happens when we don't invest in water infrastructure, kind of what happens to both water quality and water scarcity. So what we have here is, uh, this is this is a data set uh, by the World Health Organization and UNICEF that's been looking at, at the share of the population with access to safely managed drinking water for the past 20 years or so, from 2000 to 2020. And what we can see here is that this is Latin America up here, and this is the world. We can see that the world's done a lot of work, especially the last 10 years, of trying to get people onto safely managed drinking water. To the point now that we're you know, approaching about 80% of the global, global population uh, that, that's there. This is Mexico. Mexico has remained almost stagnant for the past 20 years. This is what happens when we don't invest in water, in water infrastructure, right? 57% uh, of the population more than half of the population still does not have safely managed access to drinking water. This becomes even more stark when we look at the least developed countries in the world. The least developed countries in the world have been doing a pretty good job of trying to get up there, and they're gaining on Mexico. This is shameful. This is absolutely shameful that an economy of this size, size still has half of its population that doesn't have access to clean drinking water. Now, it's not only drinking water. It's also water stress and water scarcity that, 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 that we've been suffering from, from not being able to invest in these systems and not being able to properly manage our water resources. This right here, what these are, these are municipalities. Um, and what the green ones mean that these are, what, these are municipalities that have water access every single day. The red ones are municipalities that have water access once or twice a day. This data set represents about 50% of the entire population of Mexico right now. And as you can see, back in 20, 2000, the year 2000, we had close to 60% of municipalities had daily access to water, and only 2% uh, had access about once or twice a week. What's happened? Well, this green, green graph has gone down to about 33% now of municipalities that have uh, daily access to water, and, and the red has gone up. So now 20% of all municipalities in the country only have access to water once or twice a week. And we don't see this any more more acutely than we do in Baja, California. Sorry. sorry. Back in 2000, Baja California Sur, 76% of the population had daily access to water. Today, less than 25%. This is, the, this is where we're going, right? Um, and we really can't talk about water in Mexico in, in, in this year, 2023, without talking about Monterey. Monterey, Mexico is the second most significant economic um, sector in, in the entire country. It's a population that's been booming, about 5.6 million people. And last year, they declared day zero, when, when their reservoirs were at less than 5% of their capacity due to massive drought throughout the country. So there's tons of industry there, right? And so the Mexican government reached out and actually pleaded over and over again with Coca-Cola, with Heineken, with 60 plus other large extractors asking them to use less water to make more available for public, dis public supply, uh, for human consumption, because we're in an emergency. It fell on deaf ears. 
they opened up less than, you know, around 4% of their 90 billion liter uh, uh, um, average that they, that they have access to every year, which, which wasn't nearly, nearly enough. Um, and so because of that, this is, this is, this is the scene we saw in, until the rain started coming and refilling the aquifers. I, I will say that Coca-Cola did, did open up its Topo Chico factory and said, anybody who wants to come gets free water, um, but it was, you know, it's in a place, part of the city that's not very accessible and, and uh, it's not, not very useful for most people. Um, so with that, it's hard for me to talk about water in Mexico without talking about Coca-Cola and water privatization. Um, Mexico, historically, was the number one consumer of Coca-Cola and soda products uh, globally per capita, uh, because Coca-Cola has a huge, huge presence here. Now, with the soda tax in 2014, that's actually been really, really effective. Now, Coca-Cola was very against that soda tax, as was the US government, as was the European Union, but it's been proven to be actually very, very effective in actually lowering um, uh, uh, consumption of, of soft drinks, uh, and it dropped Mexico down to the fourth position. But I'm not gonna talk about, that's not why I'm here to talk about. Uh, I'd love to talk more about that, but we'll just talk about Coca-Cola and water. So Coca-Cola has 46 concessions that we know of, that we've been able to trace throughout the country, about 28 million cubic meters, that's about 28 billion liters of water they have access to every year. But it's not all just to produce Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola also makes and bottles water. In fact, they bottle about 25, or they sell about 25% of bottled water in Mexico. Um, and, and, and this is huge. This is a multi-billion dollar a year industry. Now they pay, from what I can tell, a fraction of a peso per cubic meter. Cubic meter is about 1,000 meters. Um, and just to give you guys an idea, the average cost for residential use across the country, this, this varies widely, uh, but there's a really interesting study to done on this, but the average cost for a cubic meter is about 80 pesos. Coca-Cola is paying about 20,000 times less. Now obviously they have to treat the water, they have to bottle it, so it has all, all these other costs that, are, that go in, but they end, up sell, they end up selling it in the form of CL for about 2,350 pesos. So just an absolute massive markup. And with that, let's talk a little bit more about bottled water in general, it's not just throw Coca-Cola in the bus. Um, by the way, Dan is, is the biggest uh, seller of Coca-Cola in, in, in Mexico, the French company, they represent about 40% of it. But anyway, Mexico is continues to be the largest consumer per capita of bottled water in the world. Um, why? Because 57% of the population doesn't have access to safely managed potable drinking water. We already talked about that, right? But this is about five times above, above the average, and about 70% are, are, are these, these garofonis that we all know all uh, very well here um, in, in the country. Um, now the thing is, is that we can't trust the bottled water part of the time. Uh, there's been some really interesting studies, uh, mostly by, by, this, uh, by this researcher, Dr. Diego Gracias Ortiz, from the UNAM San Luis Potosí, who discovered levels in, in things like CL, I, actually I shouldn't say that because I don't remember, remember which ones, but in bottled water, she found levels of, of arsenic that are seven times above the allowable limit. They're selling this for a massive, massive market. They don't pay basically anything for, for, for their water. They treat it and they sell it back to us and they don't even have the decency to treat it uh, as part of time. Uh, Peña Fiel in 2019, after a study done by, by Consumer Reports in the US, discovering arsenic levels almost double the allowable limit, had to shut down their factory because of the, of the political blowback from that. So that brings us here to where we are today, Guanajuato, getting closer and closer to home, and how all this ties together, I hope. Um, so what's going on in Guanajuato? Here we are in Guanajuato. This is that water stress map again. And, and, and Guanajuato is in this extremely high water stress category. Again, meaning that we're using 80% of our available water or more every single year. It's or more, by the way. Um, and what we've, sent, what we've seen, so we in Caminos Agua just did an analysis looking at all of the aquifers in the state. And we found that it's actually about 65% of the aquifers that are overexploited. But here's the rub. 96% of the water we actually take out come from those over-extracted aquifers. So this water stress, this is an index of, of one to five. And five means that you're at day zero, okay? Um, and and water water is at 4.94. It's second only into the country uh, to Baja California Sur, which we already showed before, right? which has some pretty severe water stress conditions, just to give you an idea of, of what the future holds, unfortunately. Um, now I want to go more specifically into our region. Uh, here we are in San Miguel. Uh, I'm not going to go into San Miguel because San Miguel is not a higher hydrological zone. San Miguel is part of a greater watershed called the Upper Rio Laja watershed, um, which is these seven municipalities with uh, that where, where about 700,000 people share access to water, uh, mostly groundwater. We do have the raging Rio Laja that comes through. Um, 
used to be raging. It used to be a, a year a year round river, but now it's a seasonal river um, that comes into into the press area day here um, at the bottom. And so, what's been going on in our region? Well, with the advent of two wells back in the 1940s and 1950s, we started drilling wells, and we could drill those wells tens of meters deep, you know, 10, 20, 30, 40 meters deep, um, and start extracting water. But then, with the first Green Revolution in the 1970s, we started to drill a lot more wells and extract a lot more water. So much so that we knew by the early 1980s that we were already over-extracting our, our groundwater supply. We were over-exploiting it. We were taking out more water than goes back in by, by recharge. By today, we have thousands of wells in our region, and the water tables dropped hundreds of meters. We quite often test wells in our region that are 500 meters deep. 10 times deeper than when, we, when they first started drilling uh, several decades ago. And with that, we started tapping into fossil water. In our case, this is water that's upwards of tens of thousands of years old that's been mixing and mingling with uh, volcanic rock and taking up all sorts of minerals and metals. Lots of them good, like calcium, magnesium, but a couple of bad ones in our case, arsenic and fluoride, and taking up in very, very high levels. These are things that we've been uh, testing in, in Camino Zabra for many, many years, and this is just one example, but these are the arsenic levels that we've tested. And basically, it means everything that's over here is bad. Everything over here is, is above the limit. About 61% of all the wells we've tested are above the allowable limits for arsenic. And these are all real community wells where people are drinking the water. Upwards of 200, or sorry, 24 times above the allowable limit. This is a real community where people are absolutely drinking this water. Now, it's not just a problem for us. This is an unfortunate uh, reality of groundwater in Mexico. We're part of a water network called INCA, which is the, the translates into the, the National Water Quality Inventory, that's been mapping out specifically arsenic and fluoride around the country. We estimate that it's, um, it's in excessive levels in about 20 different states, um, with about 21 million people in Mexico alone who are, ex who are exposed to excessive levels of arsenic and or fluoride in, in their water. And very, very generally speaking, about 200 to 300 million people globally, but we don't really know because these things are hard to test for. Um, and we think it's probably much higher. Now, urban San Miguel is not uh, immune to any of this. Uh, this is just one example of literally hundreds that we have. Um, but looking at arsenic, this is just looking at arsenic specifically in the urban center of San Miguel, specifically at a point in Colonia Independencia, that in 2017, it was you know pretty much right at the allowable limit. Um, that's what this is here. And then just a few years later, 2022, it was almost three times above the limit. Um, there's a lot of different things that are happening that, that make that happen, but just to say that this is also happening in our, our urban center as well. So what do these things do? Well, fluoride is good and bad. We need fluoride. We don't want to demonize fluoride too much because we, we need it. That's why we have it on toothpaste. Fluoride is probably, is probably responsible for the end of tooth decay around the, around the world. But when we start consuming it, and the levels that I was just showing before, it starts to have the opposite effect. The reason we have fluoride in toothpaste is because it has a really strong reaction to calcium. So what happens is when we start ingesting these really high levels, it starts to deteriorate the calcium. The first thing we see here is uh, 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 dental fluorosis. This is, um, this is irreversible. This impacts children um, uh, much more acutely than adults. All of this impacts children much more acutely. Um, and this is going to manifest itself into other areas where we have calcium, specifically bones. Crippling skeletal, crippling skeletal fluorosis, which is actually the deformation and the weakening of bones. We also have been seeing over time uh, major, major impacts in cognitive development and learning disabilities in children because of uh, various calcium deposits we have in the brain. There's been some really important long-term studies that have looked at, at, at the long-term effects of children who are exposed to fluoride from, from, uh, from pregnancy uh, to about 10 years old and a very close correlation to their IQ and their, their cognitive development. Arsenic, there's no good level of arsenic. Arsenic is completely toxic to us. The World Health Organization called arsenic in Bangladesh the, the largest mass poisoning of a population in history. We want to get as close to zero as possible for arsenic. Um, arsenic impacts all sorts of, of things, um, uh, as well as cognitive development and learning disabilities in children, this thing called arsenicosis, and also several types of cancer. Now, also, arsenic and fluoride are both, both of them are very cl uh, closely tied to kidney damage. And so when we actually look at the burden of chronic kidney disease around the globe, look at Mexico. Mexico is one of, one of the highest ones. I'm not going to say it's all because of the water. There's all sorts of things that are going on, uh, quite obviously. But just to say, it's probably playing a, a pretty important factor, which is why um, this year we are starting a, a study with the National Public Health Institute to actually look at kidney damage in children uh, who are drinking this contaminated water over, over the long term. Oh yeah, and it's really hard to remove. 
Arsenic and fluoride, uh, we can't really get out of the water, okay? Um, not, not easily, I should say. Um, uh, you know, we have all these different options from boiling water, which actually concentrates these, these uh, much more, to these things that are really popular in San Miguel, these whole house filtration systems. None, none of these things can touch arsenic and fluoride in the water. And the reason I, I really want to talk about this is actually because of all the things I didn't get to talk about today. Arsenic and fluoride are really representative of this new class of water contamination that are impacting water supplies around the world. Industrial runoff, pesticides, all these different organic chemicals that are getting into water, um, and leaves and livestock farms. We've got major problems with nitrates getting into aquifers. These are all very difficult things to, to, to deal with. And so really, arsenic and fluoride are just representative of this big, big challenge we have moving forward on how to actually treat our water and have uh, portable water moving forward. Well, I guess I, I ruined the surprise. Who's using all of our water? <laughs> Agriculture. Um, so we can be as angry as we want to be about, um, about uh, overdevelopment in San Miguel and, and all of this, but really, it's not 70%, it's not 75%. Over 85% of all the groundwater we extract in our region goes to agriculture. Now, unfortunately, in Mexico, it's not as easy as the Colorado River to figure out how much is going to livestock feed, how much is going to corn, barley, all these things. We don't have that kind of data because we, 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 we literally, it's impossible for us to know how much water people are actually using, even if we have the concession data. Um, we're looking into it right now to try to get a, a good idea, but we know here in our region, a major, major user is alfalfa. Sound familiar? We've been talking about this, right? Guanajuato is actually the second or third largest producer. Look at how little Guanajuato is. Second or third largest producer of alfalfa in Mexico, producing tons and tons of alfalfa, again, almost exclusively for dairy cattle, producing a water-intensive crop here in our region for dairy cattle. That's what's drawing down our crop. Um, I think I've got some time. So I, I want to switch gears a little bit and talk a little bit about the impacts of climate change here. What we have here, all these blue bars, blue bars are historical average rainfalls in San Miguel. Okay, and these red bars are 2023. This is what, what happened here in 2023. This was uh, what we measured up at our office here at Caminos de Agua. Now at first glance, it looks relatively okay, except for a couple of glaring things that stick out, right? In September, you know, we didn't do so well this year. But look at June. It almost didn't rain June, and that's our second most important rain uh, month, historically. So, so what does that mean? Well, it means that was anybody here in June? Do you guys remember how hot it was in June? It was brutal, right? And so what was going on? Well, that's, that's a time of the year when, when farms start using less groundwater because, because of rain. Do you think they stopped producing during June because they didn't get rain this year? No. They started using more groundwater. So these are some of the things we're going to start seeing with climate changes. Much more erratic rainfall patterns, uh, less predictable, potentially smaller rainy seasons, um, which are going to force us to continue to use more and more groundwater. Now, what we can't see in this data is, is the daily averages. This is another thing that, 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 that climate change is going to be contributing to. What does that mean? It means that the rainfall that we did get this year, what we don't see here is that 75% of all the rain we got this year happened over a period of 11 or 12 days. But normally, we could, have, we could count on rain every single day at least a little bit. Now we have these massive rain events, uh, you know, one day, two days, and then we have nothing. Another massive rain event. So what's that going to cause? We know it's going to cause. We've seen it. This is San Miguel this year, underwater. I apologize if this is somebody's car on, on Calle Zacateros, um, but it was just very impactful to me. Uh, um, but this is the, the, the new bridge in front of the underground bridge, which I always said was a mistake. I always said it was going to flood, and it flooded. Um, but, th but this is what happens when we don't plan properly, um, and, and with climate change making things much more difficult than moving forward. Um, so, so what can we do? Um, I'm wrapping up now. Um, and anything I would say now, it's going to be very much oversimplifying the problem. Um, I have a lot of other things going into what we can do globally and, and all this stuff, but, but really, I do want to focus on the local because these are really locally, uh, locally acute problems that we're dealing with. Uh, there's, there's, there's global implications to all of this, but really, uh, everything is so unique to a certain degree in each place that we're dealing with these issues that we have to deal with in there. So, so I just want to just talk a little bit about Mexico, what we can do. Um, sorry for all the words on this one. but. Uh, First thing we need to do, and that's been being pushed for many, many years, and as the Supreme Court says it has to happen now, is that we need a new general, federal, uh, national level uh, water law, but we need to have it needs to have some very specific things in it. 
um, which we hope will happen, uh, but specifically allow us to regulate um, and limit the water concessions that we have, eradicate those power reserves, like those irrigation districts I was talking about before, um, and also defragment this water management uh, around the country where municipalities are responsible for so much brunt of the work and are not qualified to be doing it. That is how we have to, have to move to fulfill the human right to water um, in Mexico, which was enshrined in the Constitution on my birthday in 2012, uh, right when I first came down here, actually. Um, globally, not just in Mexico, we need to start charging line with costs. We are underpricing water across the globe substantially. Now, we have to do so in a way that, uh, that, that, that targets uh, the support for those most vulnerable, obviously. Um, but, but we are undercharging for, for water, and we also need to have much more clear uh, transparency in, in the methodology of charging. What we have here, I don't want to go into it, but this is just the different tariffs that people pay for water in Mexico. It's all over the board. There's no consolidation uh, across any of that. Um, and with that, we also have to be removing water subsidies, specifically for the rich. The highest, the, 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 the wealthiest uh, fifth in Mexico pays proportionally less for water than the lowest. That is just... Across the board, uh, one of the major issues we're, we're dealing with here. And one thing I didn't mention, but agriculture doesn't pay for its water. I think I mentioned that. <laughs> um, they also receive subsidies for, for, pump, for, for their electricity, wow. especially the biggest producers who are really apt and, and know how to, how, to, how to do that. There, there's millions of dollars of subsidies available for them. So not only are they not paying for the water, but they're also not paying for, for the electricity or for, for the electricity that they need to pump the water is subsidized at the very least. Uh, and very specifically, I think I've probably been clear on this point, but we, we, need, we need to reform the law as soon as possible so that agricultural users pay their fair share for water, period. This cannot go on any longer. Um, if, if you don't have to pay for water, you don't appreciate water. That's not enough. We also have to put in some more deep fines for actual abusers of, of the water concessions. Right now, the only thing that agriculture does pay is if, if, if they happen to go over their concession, they pay, I think, 17 centavos per cubic meter. Absolute joke. Um, and with all of that money, then we can actually hire new um, inspectors. We can invest in uh, infrastructure and management so that we can get some low-hanging fruit, like maybe lowering the 40% the waste of and leaks in, in, in the system, um, and actually have a, a much more coherent management moving forward. Um, so I think it's important to talk a little bit about the political issues, but I, I don't want to focus on that because I know people want to know, you know what it is that, that we can actually do. So, on a larger level, we also have to be looking at our food system, I think I've tried to make that clear. And there's a, a bunch of things that I'm not qualified to talk about. Regenerative agriculture, reforestation, all of these things are key to climate change, to water security moving forward. Um, I, I just want to mention one that I think is, uh, that really spoke to me specifically because it's about agaves and it's about our region. There's this program from Regeneration International called the Billion Agaves, and that's, that's the goal, is to plant a billion agaves. Why? Because agaves don't use water. They, they use almost no water. Um, and what they've found um, is that when you chop it up, that's what's happening here, when you chop up agave, you, pe you plant it densely with things like mesquite trees, which are also use very little water once they mature, um, and they're native to this region. When you chop it up really finely and you ferment it, it actually becomes uh, a really highly nutritious fodder for, for, for cattle, um, for sheep. There's actually uh, an example right up here. There's a couple examples here uh, that I know of. Um, the Organica Ranch has, has one with sheep right now, uh, more as a demonstration. But uh, I think Cañada de la Virgen, they've started using um, uh, uh, agave fodder um, in, in their production there. Um, and the cool thing about agave is that we use, what, do you guys know what we use agave for? You guys know what <laughs> Tequila, mezcal, right? To make tequila and mezcal, you use what's called the pina, uh, the, 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 the heart of it, right? And then you chop off the leaves of the pancas, which are massive, huge biomass. And you know what, what, what they do with the pancas? Nothing. It's like 90% waste. They have no use for the pancas. But you can turn that into animal fat, right? So you can actually have a pretty interesting system here moving forward. So I just want to mention that you know, the system also sequesters carbon, which is added plus, and again, doesn't use water. So it's really cool. um, also, we're looking at rainwater capture, right? We, can, we can't only depend on groundwater. Now, we can't harvest enough rainwater to meet all of our needs. <laughs> Well, technically speaking, but if you do the math, but um, but but it, it's not it's not feasible. But Mexico City has been making huge strides, and a lot of people always ask us, you know, is it actually legal to capture water in, in Mexico? And it's actually being promoted by the government right now. This is a huge, huge thing in my eyes. 
Um, the Mexican government a few years ago made, made, made this uh, pronouncement that they're going to build 100,000 household rainwater harvesting systems in Mexico City. Now they've gotten to like 60,000 and the program's coming to an end, but it's still a huge, huge initiative. Um, they just announced this, that they're going to be building uh, 2,000, up to, close to 2,000 rainwater capture systems in all of the elementary schools in, in Mexico City moving forward. So, so we're starting to take this on that, that we have to take advantage of our other water resources, not only groundwater um, and, and river and reservoir water moving forward. What can we do? Well, we can capture the water, right? You don't have to capture enough rainwater to, for all of your needs, but you can help. You can capture some to help subsidize your needs. You can capture it off your roofs into cisterns here, but you can also capture it into the soil, planting native plants, doing uh, what, what we call, I love this term, uh, rain gardens, right? Where we actually are creating micro watersheds within, within our house. Um, and and it's, it's not a complex thing to do. But it's a way that we can return water to the soil, to our aquifers. Yes, it's a little bit of water, but every little bit counts. And more than anything, it connects us to our water, which is something that we really need to be doing moving forward. Um, we can also be learning from, from desert communities. Uh, these are both from, from Arizona. Uh, this, is, this is Phoenix, who's been creating a food forest that after all of, all of the, the drought and all the, the issues with, with the Colorado River, they've been doing lots of amazing things. I love this one. Um, this is in Tucson, Arizona. There's some, they have like half the, the rainfall that we have every year, but they're doing amazing, amazing things with, 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 with rain, rain, rainwater capture. I don't remember what this is called. I, I call I call these like the sunken boulevards because I always think I remember on World Water Day a couple years ago I was watching a Sapasma truck uh, go down the street on one of those boulevards that was filled with non-native species and just spraying at 12 o'clock in the in the afternoon with water to get these these things to grow. And it's like if you just change your, the, the chip a little bit, right? Instead of putting it above ground, let's bury it. And all of a sudden, we realize that we have uh, roads which have a massive amount of surface area to capture rainwater, divert it into these into these little sunken boulevards, and and return water back back to the ground and, and, and the plants. Um, so just some things we'll be looking at moving, moving forward. Um, we also have to talk about water treatment. Because those contaminants, those chemicals that are contaminants that I was talking about, those aren't going away. Uh, in our case, in our region, they're absolutely not going away. The damage has been done. There's no turning the clock back on our and fluoride contamination. It's just not possible. Uh, one of the big things we have to look at is desalination, right? This is why I was talking about desal before. Um, this is a, a community-scale desalination uh, uh, system that, that, that we looked at many, many years ago, um, and it's just very inefficient. On, on a good day, we produce like two liters of water. Um, you know, so they said it produced upwards of 19, but, but I, I, I never saw that. Um, but this just came out, MIT's been doing some work on, on desalination, and they've got a really simple system that's producing five to six liters per, per hour, I think. Um, and they, they say it can be cheaper than tap water moving forward. So these are some of the things we have to be looking at. Um, we in Communos de Agua have been looking at community scale treatment plants that are targeted uh, to contaminants like arsenic and fluoride. Um, and we're doing so in a way that the community owns the technology moving forward, uh, because that's paramount to all of this. And, and what we've also been doing is creating a bridge. So what we have here is actually the State Water Commission is here learning from our community partners about how this works because we need to create that conversation between all levels of government and those who are actually taking care of our water resources uh, in the most sustainable way as possible. Um, and I just want to end today talking about one thing very specific that we can do because we have to talk about it. We have to talk about the water we need. Um, whether we're talking about green water, red, blue water, all this, you know, gray water, all these different things, the fact of the matter is that most experts agree that the current, our current diet, our current global diet, diet is not sustainable for the future. It's just not, not for water, not for carbon, not for all, all for, for, for all these issues we're talking about today. So we really need to look at our diet and start thinking about how how we can, how are we going to produce that more more food that we need to produce with less water moving forward. So uh, this has come through with the Lancet, the, the planetary diet, which is obviously very vegetable forward. Um, you know, animal sourced protein and dairy takes up a much lo smaller smaller percentage. I'm not saying none. I'm just saying can we reduce it a little bit? Um, it's going to make a huge, huge impact on the planet, and really focusing on our protein from more plant-based sources. Now, I show this because, um, you know, with a little bit of hope, I, I think, is, is this is what's happened in Mexico. This is pretty cool. This is the, I don't know when you guys were kids, when I was a kid, it was the, the food period, was, was what told us to, what to eat. It turned into something different, which I don't know what it is. Mexico had what they called the, the plate of good eating. Um, and they just changed it this year in 2023 to not just be the plate of good eating, sorry, it's the, the translation, but it's the, the plate of healthy and sustainable eating. And it's based off the planet, it's largely based off the planetary diet. 
So they're taking the cue here. They put water in the center, right? Uh, they, they lump together uh, dairy and eggs and all these things and, and, and meat into what they call an, from animal origin. It takes up a, a much smaller uh, uh, portion of the pie and really focus on legumes uh, for, for uh, uh, a, a less water intensive, less planet intensive or environmentally intensive uh, source of protein. And also it's really cool because they use things you know, like tortillas and natural, natural crops and, and things that we, we consume here in Mexico. So, I just want to leave it there um, and open up to questions. Thank you, Dylan. That was extraordinary. Thank you so much.